What's up, guys? We're gonna watch three disturbing mysteries that will make you question humanity. All right, let's go. Shadow's a streamer now, pretty much. Today's video is sponsored by Established Titles, the company that allows you to purchase as little as one square foot of Scottish land. So Dude, I was gonna get sponsored by this company. I, I don't know if I liked it. I, I actually was like, kind of like, no, I don't wanna do this. It's like a company where you can buy one square foot of Scottish land and become a lord. I thought it was kind of dumb. Is that me? Am I, am I just like an ass? Anyone else think that's kind of lame? <clears throat> Are you on YouTube for good now? Yes. So you can officially be pronounced as Lord or Lady. Established titles commits to planting a tree with every purchase and preserving the pristine woodlands of That's Scotland. That's the coolest thing I've ever heard of. Charities like One Tree Planted and Trees for uh -oh. the Future. So you is, is it going to come off? Your lordship or lady is your feather going to come off finally? No. Fight deforestation and supported the beauty and biodiversity of our planet. Their site has a wide selection of title packages to choose from. Description. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm an asshole. I want one square foot of Scottish land. Well, to be fair, it's for charity. They didn't tell me that. They didn't tell me that. That's not my fault. They never mentioned that it was for charity. I wonder if that's a new thing. Because when I did it, it was just, oh, we're just uh, taking land. Or we're taking... Oh, God. Yeah. They didn't say anything about charity. So don't blame me. I didn't know. First up. We have a mystery you may have heard of before, that of Oki Albert Kite Jr. Blame it on Jorge did a great deep dive into this cold case. Blame it on George, we've watched his videos before. <clears throat> but right now, I'm gonna have a stab at it myself. Oki, or Al as he preferred to be called, was known for being a kind and easygoing guy. The type of okay, man no, that had no, no enemies Not when you're tuning on my cables. Not on my cables. Even his ex-wife, okay. Gail, whom he divorced cables. in 2002 remained good friends with him long after they had separated, and Al went out of his way to keep a good relationship with his stepdaughter, Julie. In early 2004, Al was living the carefree bachelor's lifestyle. Despite having lost his wife, stepdaughter, and previous job just two years prior, the 53-year-old was now doing very well for How do you lose all that shit and just bounce right back, man? What the hell? ...for himself once again. He'd purchased a two-story townhouse in Aurora, Colorado, and had landed a new job at the consulting firm, Carter Douglas. During a work function, he also happened to meet a charming woman named Linda Angelopoulos. The pair quickly headed off and began a casual romance, one which quickly blossomed into something more serious. Now with a new partner, a new job, and newfound happiness, there was just one thing Al still needed. A new tenant. As mentioned, Al's townhouse in Aurora was two stories. He lived on the top floor and rented out the lower one to bring in a little extra cash each month. In May 2004, his previous tenant had moved out, so Al was on the hunt for a new housemate to fill his empty room. He put up uh -oh. ads in the University of Colorado's library, and on May 19th, someone responded. A guy who went by the name Robert Cooper. Okay, so he killed him. So this guy must have murdered him or something like that. I mean, we already have his his profile well, drawn. Whoever this Robert Cooper was. So he, yeah, he, he killed someone. Desperate for a place to stay and wanted to move in as quickly as possible. He told Al over the phone that he could have the security <clears throat> deposit and first month's rent for him that same day in order to secure the lease. Mr. Cooper also mentioned that he worked at Wells Fargo said that he had just been transferred from the East Coast, hence why he needed a place to stay. Robert Cooper ticked all the boxes and sounded like a decent enough guy, so Al agreed to rent him the room. Perhaps, he thought, this could be the start of a new friendship. At some or so point, we within thought. the next three days, Al's girlfriend, Linda, 
came to the townhouse to pay him a visit. She just so happened to arrive while Al was showing Robert Cooper around the downstairs apartment. Al asked Linda if she'd like to meet the new tenant. She said of course she would, but she had to use the bathroom first. In the short space of time that Linda was inside the bathroom, Cooper told Al that he had forgotten about an important appointment he had and hastily made for the exit. As Linda Thus? stepped out of the bathroom, she only caught the briefest glimpse of Cooper's back as he left. According to both Linda and several other neighbors, he was a well-dressed man who appeared to be in his late 30s or early 40s, of medium height and build, with dark, curly hair. Imposter? Most notably, Linda said that he walked with a limp and carried a cane. Neither she nor Okay, so he left and did something then. If they're like talking about if they're describing him, what did he do? Thought much about Robert Cooper's speedy exit. <clears throat> maybe he really did have a prior engagement. Or maybe he had some social anxiety problems and didn't want to meet Linda for some reason. Either way, it wasn't a big deal. As long as the guy kept up with the rent, he could come and go as he pleased. A few days later, on May 22nd, Al dropped Linda off at the airport. She was taking a week-long trip to Virginia Beach, while Al finalized the contract with Mr. Cooper and helped him settle in. Cooper said he needed some assistance with moving an armchair down the stairs, or something like that, and Al, being a nice guy, offered to lend a hand. Linda's plane landed safely later that day, and she called Al at 3.30 p.m. to tell him that she had arrived. Got pushed down the stairs? But there was something off about the phone call. Al wasn't his usual happy-go-lucky self. Instead, he was quiet, distracted, maybe even uncomfortable. Figuring that he was just busy helping Cooper. Are you American? Linda wished him a good weekend, and they both exchanged I love yous before hanging up. I don't know. Linda had no idea that she would never speak to Al again. Nor would he held a gunpoint or some shit? Except, perhaps, for the man who took his life. On May 24th, just two days after Linda's departure, Al's absence at work was noticed by his boss. That was slightly alarming. Al was a diligent and punctual worker. He wouldn't have just taken a day the off bird without notifying down the, the company. <clears throat> the boss tried to call Al, but got no response. To be on the safe side, he called up Al's sister, Barbara, and asked if she could check up on him. Barbara didn't live in Colorado, so she, in turn, called up the local authorities. Within minutes, officers were on their way to Al's home to conduct a welfare check. They knocked on his door, but nobody answered. Realizing that the door had been left unlocked. Pig is Texan way different? I got the big iron on my hip at all times, chat. The officers slowly entered and took a look around, hoping to find some trace of Al inside. Well, they found more than just a trace. At the bottom of the stairs to the basement, they found Al, hogtied and lying face down in a puddle of his own blood. He had been struck in the back of the head with a blunt object while walking down the stairs. But it wasn't the strike that killed him. While oh incapacitated God. at the bottom of the stairs, his attacker tied up his arms and legs behind his back and then proceeded to torture him. For hours. The soles of his feet were extremely bruised and swollen, having been repeatedly beaten with a steel honing rod. Okay, what is this picture though? What is happening here in this picture? Like, regardless of the story, where did you find this picture? What website did you find this picture? A form of punishment known as balaka. Sharp blades from his own kitchen have been inserted into his ears, oh. down through his shoulders, and even into the spaces right above his eyes. Oh! Oh! Average chiropractic experience. <laughs> The unusual way in which Al had been bound made it impossible for him to move. All he could do was endure the pain. Finally, whoever had done this to him 
have finished him off with twenty-two stabs to the chest, head, and neck. The final blows were so ferocious that Al's head was nearly detached from his own body. Sickeningly, after taking Al's life, the perp then made himself at home. He cleaned up the scene, ate food from Al's fridge, wore Al's clothes, took a shower in his bathroom. Chad, this is, okay, this is why I have trust issues, man. This is why I trust no one. It, it, is, it is a safer life if you literally trust no one. And even slept in his bed. Something very reminiscent of the Japanese Setagaya family massacre case. It's believed that Cooper may have stayed in Al's home for more than a full day after slaying him. Perhaps the perp wanted to know what it felt like to be his victim. Perhaps he just got a thrill out of remaining at the scene. Perhaps taking Al's life wasn't enough, and he wanted to take his privacy, too. Whatever was going through the guy's head, it was clear to the investigators that they weren't dealing with an ordinary killer. Whoever this man was, he hadn't known Al personally, but had still taken great satisfaction in his work, and he had to have been planning this for a very long time. You can trust chat? No. No, I cannot. <clears throat> But then you have no one to help you either. And who the hell who do, who the hell do I need help from? I need help from no one. I got my wife and my son. That's it. No one else. I don't need help from anybody. I mean, if if you guys really want to trust anyone, go ahead. Be my guest. If you guys genuinely want to trust people, go ahead. You know. Just don't be weak. Yeah, tell that to the guy who got knocked out and then hogtied and then tortured to death. Just don't be weak, man. Like, just, like, what? Oh, what? Oh, sorry that you got knocked out when you had your back turned and then got hogtied and tortured? Maybe just get stronger. Maybe don't be a bitch. You know? Jesus Christ. Trusting chat is like trusting a criminal. The video was quiet, man. I wish someone told me that an hour ago. Investigator on the case, Detective Thomas Sobieski, believes that Al was struck in the head while helping his new tenant, Robert Cooper, move in. This Robert Cooper was the obvious suspect. Now all the authorities had to do was track him down. To begin with, they found the crumpled up rental contract between Cooper and Al. Watching these vi type of videos a lot doesn't help with trust. <clears throat> even if I didn't chat, literally, even if I didn't watch these videos, I still don't trust people. That's just me. Because in my real life, in my personal life, I've not had good experiences with random people. So that's why 99.99% of the time, I don't trust people. All right. I don't know why that's such like a hot take for you guys. But you what? You don't trust people? But they don't ever have friends. But but they don't ever have anyone in life to help you. In the kitchen bin. The contract contained all of Cooper's personal information. But obviously, it had all been made up. His social security number belonged to an 80-year-old woman who lived in Indiana. His address was for an elementary school in Denver. His reference phone number was from an Aurora retirement village, and the name Robert Cooper was of course an alias. No one with that name worked at Wells Fargo or had moved to the area. Because this guy had chosen to target Al, not because he knew him, but because he had an apartment to rent, they didn't really have a lot to work with. But they did have something. When the perp finally left the townhouse, he took Al's debit card and truck keys with him. He then drove Al's vehicle to a nearby ATM, where he withdrew a thousand dollars of his victim's hard-earned cash. That's dumb. Why would he do that? Like, what? What uh, was? Is that why he did it? Why would you do? That's so dumb. Hey, here I am. Criminals are so stupid. God, I could, I could be such a better criminal, chat. While doing so, the ATM's inbuilt camera took several pictures of the killer, 
his face hidden behind a ski mask. Strangely, Al had a lot more savings in his checking account, and the perp could have taken a much heftier sum if he wanted to, but for some reason only took a thousand dollars. Then again, money clearly wasn't this guy's motive. Don't you need he some identification him, documents for renting? Life for financial to be, yeah, to be fair, he probably didn't give him any no. background checks. He'd done it simply because he could. After withdrawing the money, Cooper again returned to Al's townhouse, <clears throat> removed all the blades he had inserted into Al, and then placed them in the kitchen sink, along with the steel honing rod. He poured bleach all over them, as well as down the shower drain to remove any DNA evidence he left behind. Finally, he walked out the front door and vanished into the night. To this That's Sasquatch? Stay. Nobody knows who Robert Cooper really was, or why he did what he did. He'd been careful not to leave behind any trace of his identity, even in the lead up to the slaying. The only evidence he had left behind was his phone number, which he had used to contact Al in the first place, but it turned out that he had actually been using a burner phone. That very phone was found in downtown Denver, and investigators were able to work out which 7-Eleven Cooper had purchased it from. One close to the University of Colorado's library. But Cooper had done his homework. He had waited 30 days to activate his burner phone. And guess how long that 7-Eleven kept their CCTV footage before deleting it? Bingo. Exactly 30 days. Okay, never mind. He's actually he actually planned all this out. He's not that he's Cooper not that dumb. He was also smart enough not to call anyone else using that phone. So, unfortunately, this seemingly vital piece of evidence was, in reality, worthless. Mr. Cooper had been disturbingly methodical. As the investigators would come to learn, <clears throat> just before Al's untimely slaughter, numerous other landlords in Aurora had left ads at the University of Colorado's library, looking for tenants to rent their empty rooms. Many of them had been contacted by a man, calling himself Robert Cooper. Several of them even met with him. One landlord described him as a well-dressed man who walked without a limp. Another landlord, who happened to be familiar with European dialects, said that the man spoke with a distinctly Romanian accent. According to her, Cooper spent a lot of time examining her windows. Both landlords agreed that he gave off a creepy vibe, with one of them saying that he made the hair on the back of her neck stand up, and because of that, they both turned him away. Well, their intuitions likely saved their lives, and if they hadn't followed their gut instincts, we'd probably be talking about one of their deaths here, instead of Al's. But Al, like... If you're doing a disguise, always fake a limp. <clears throat> this is actually kind of crazy how much... How many lengths he went to not get caught. I mean, it worked. He didn't get caught. To think the best of people. Always had. And that cost him everything. As it stands, the case of Al Kite remains unsolved to this very day and the true identity of Robert Cooper remains shrouded in mystery. But the audacity of his actions, the amount of effort he put into finding his victim, the time he invested in planning this whole thing, the efficiency with which he pulled it off, the confidence he displayed by remaining at the scene, and the joy he clearly got from his work. Well, it all makes me wonder whether this really was just a one-time deal, or whether Al was just another victim on this killer's sick resume. A lot of internet sleuths believe that's the case. Again, chat, don't trust people, all right? That's my advice today. Don't trust people. And when I say people, I mean strangers, all right? I don't know, I, I don't know why everyone got up in arms last time when I said don't trust people. I feel like that's a pretty, pretty good uh, thing to have, is don't trust everyone. He might have an above average IQ. Those are, there are stories of people with high IQ. Do you know, you think those guys watch Rick and Morty? Huh? That's not a hot take. Apparently it was earlier. There are people in chat. Well, well, if you don't trust anyone, you'll never, you'll never find friends. You, you, you'll never find anyone to help you. 
fucking idiots. <clears throat> Bet they could turn themselves into pickles? Probably. And have tried to link Robert Cooper to other killers who were caught trying to use their victims' bank cards. Guys like Roy Charles Waller, who also liked to disguise his identity. Others have suggested the infamous Israel Keys. His MO was very similar to that of the perp in this case, and the ATM photos certainly bear a striking resemblance to him. Still, to date, no definitive connections have been drawn. But there is one piece of good news. A small amount of DNA belonging to an unknown male was uncovered on the basement stairs at Al's house. This was run through the authorities' database, and though no matches have ever turned up, the DNA did reveal that this unknown male was of Southeast European descent, and using advances in forensic technology, composite artists were recently able to create this image of his face. Okay, the first image was like an old man. Like back here looked like an old man. It does it not? This looks like a dude in his 50s. This looks like a dude in his 20s. This 3D figure is Robert Cooper. Back then, and now. With developments like this still being made more than a decade after the incident, perhaps so any one day, basic this Chad sinister figure will be brought to justice, and this rabbit hole finally filled in. With a little luck, the FBI might be able to map his family tree and find him that way in the near future. Until then, all we can do is like a second life avatar. Dude, it's just a me. Like it's just me. Actually exist. <clears throat> and that, on any given day, they could choose to target you. Not because you wronged them, but just for the thrill of it. God, Geep. If you've checked out a lot of unsolved mysteries God, content Geep. before, it can almost end up feeling like you're listening to movie plots, rather than things that have happened to real, ordinary people like you and me. But, as this next case proves, any one of us could unwillingly become the star of our own murder mystery. The year was 2005. The subject of this story? <coughs> Todd Geib, your average 22-year-old, living in the small community of Casnovia, Michigan. With a good job at Hager Distribution, an active social life, and a loving family, the future seemed bright for Todd. Pig is but sus? sadly, that future no, I'm not. was about to Did be Pig taken. just confess? Wait, what did I confess? Pig killed him? What is happening? What is happening in chat without me looking for two seconds? That's why I always carry a knife. I had an ex who would tell me I was being paranoid. <clears throat> Talking about exes and knives. Did I ever tell you guys when I worked at... I was working at this pizza restaurant. Um, it was like a wood-fired pizza place. And the dude I was working with was telling me a story about how... Uh, he was t he was telling me the story like it was like another just like a regular fight with his ex-wife. Like he's talking to, uh, about his ex-wife. He's like, yeah, you know, there was one time like we were fighting and stuff like that. And all of a sudden I felt like this white heat, like really, like a really hot in in my back and i turned around and yeah she ended up stabbing me in the back with a really sharp knife what it's like yeah i passed out had to get like 40 stitches and stuff i'm fine though what <laughs> i'm sorry she just stabbed you in the back like the fuck Yeah, I guess that's just normal for people getting stabbed. That's just like another, you know, a day in the life, you know. <clears throat> I get called homophobic slurs on my 10 minute walk to work all the time. I'd be stupid to carry a knife on me. Yeah, you, yeah, you, you better freaking carry something with you. Holy shit, dude. I feel like, you know, people of color. People who are a part of the LGBTQ community and stuff like that, like you probably, like women, you know, anyone who is not a white man, <laughs> I feel like you need to take extra precautions, dude. 
You need to take extra precautions. Taken away from him by a sinister force. June 11th, 2005 was a Saturday. And for a young and outgoing guy like Todd, that meant a night out with his buddies. Average Floridian civilization. Now, Todd and his friends were a very close group. Not surprising, since Casnovia only had a population of 314 at the time. Damn. That's he a village. It's not even a town. With his cousin at 7.30 p.m. and went to meet his friends <clears throat> at the Half Moon Bar and Grill. They ate dinner together and, at 9.30, set off to an orchard party just off a dirt road. Basically in the middle of nowhere, but still very close to where Todd was staying with his cousin. Most of the youngsters living in and around the area went to this event, about a hundred people in total. One person who wasn't attending was Todd's designated driver. She dropped Todd and the others off at the orchard and promised to pick them all up later. Straight away, the event seemed like it was going to be a rager. There was a keg yeah. and a bonfire. Dude, they got a fucking keg and a bonfire? Dude, this is small town parties to a T right here. That's like, dude, going out in the middle of nowhere, having a bonfire and a keg, dude, that is that is a goddamn Midwesterner's party right there. And by all accounts, the atmosphere was electric. A little too electric. At approximately 12.45 a.m., a fight broke out between a few of the local guys and almost erupted into a full brawl. This prompted Todd, who was still in a sober state of mind, to leave the party very abruptly. It's unclear whether he was frightened about the brawl, or whether he was just tired and wanted to get some rest. But either way, he said a quick goodbye to his friends, and told them he was going to walk home. He set off on foot. Why would you walk home? Why would you, why would you do that? And disappeared from the party into the darkness. Never to be seen again. Since to be you fair, you know what? I've done this before. Not in the middle of the woods. Uh, well, kind of. Because there, there was this place uh, that me and my friends used to uh, drink at. And we called it the, the bridge. It was like this wooden bridge. Lit Dude, after thinking about it, literally the dumbest fucking shit you could ever do in your entire life. It was a wooden bridge over the top of train tracks. And we'd go out there. It was like in the middle of nowhere in the woods. And we'd go out there and we and we drink. And whenever a train came by, we laid down on the bridge and like watched the train go underneath us because it was like really close to the bridge. Dumb shit, man. Like so fucking dumb. Like imagine if one of us fell off that, you know what I mean? Like because we were drinking, whatever, regardless. But I remember one time I was like, they were all wanting to sleep in the woods. And remember that I don't like sleeping in the woods. So I walked like all the way back to my friend's house, which was like a half mile away, um, which was uh, so. Yeah, I could see that if you just. Yeah, I could see that happening. Never mind. <clears throat> Used to live in a town where goat man's bridges. Oh, you have a goat man's bridge, too. Dude, how many people have goat man's bridges? Did he have a car or was he on foot? He was on foot. We didn't lock doors at night in my old town. Same. I do now. Uh, my I don't think my parents really do much. When I was at my parents' house, they never really locked the doors. I do. Because, yeah, fuck that. He only lived about a mile away and hadn't drunk too much. His pals weren't too worried about him making the journey by himself. But almost as soon as he left the orchard, Todd made a series of odd phone calls that were concerning to say the least. At 12.47 a.m., just two minutes after leaving the orchard, Todd called up his close friend, the woman who had dropped him off. She answered, and Todd simply said, I've had enough, before the line cut out. It's not known whether he meant he had had enough of the event and wanted to be picked up, or if he meant he had had enough generally. In another call, which he made at 12.51, <clears throat> he told that same friend, I'm in a field, before the line cut out once again. His friend immediately called him back, but all she could hear on the other end of the line was either the rush of wind or heavy breathing. Phone records show 
that Tog kept trying to call his friend back for the next five minutes, but the calls wouldn't go through. That was the last contact anyone had with Todd Guybe. He never made it home that night. While making the mile-long journey back to his cousin's house, Todd seemingly fell off the face of the earth. Dude, that, that's literally how... Like, this is how it was set up. Like, my friend's house would be right here, and we'd be, like, way out here. And I walked back. So, yeah, similar situation. What the fuck? Ancient aliens? Definitely aliens. And vanished entirely. For the next three weeks, a search effort involving 1,500 officers and volunteers worked day and night to help find Todd. Planes scoured the area from above and thermal imaging devices were used to try and locate him. In the latter days of the search, sniffer dogs were brought in to track Todd's movements. They picked up on his scent and followed it from the orchard along a dirt road and up into a field. It appeared that after leaving the party, Todd was indeed walking in the right direction back home. But strangely, the dogs lost his scent as soon as they reached the main paved road, the road that would have led Todd straight to his cousin's house the final stretch of his journey. But why did his scent simply vanish when he reached it? Did somebody pick him up after all? On July 2nd, Todd was found. But to everyone's dismay, the search for him didn't have a happy ending. A local couple found his body in Ovidal Lake, very close to where his scent disappeared, smack bang in the middle of the search area. But he wasn't submerged in the lake. He was standing upright, his head and shoulders dabbing. He was dabbing. Shoulders above the water's surface. It almost looked like he was still alive and was just treading water. But there were no ripples, and the lake was completely still. At first, the wife thought that he was a beaver. But when the couple realized what they were actually looking at, they immediately called the authorities. Investigators arrived and removed Todd from the lake. He was fully his last moments and his were dabbing. Was still in his he died doing what he loved. That's kind of lit. God damn it. Possible injuries on his body. And since he had a large amount of alcohol in his system, they theorized that Todd must have left the party, then decided to go for a drunken swim and ultimately drowned. I thought they said he was the more sober one. Am I wrong? Didn't they say that he was like the sober one? In their eyes, it was a classic case of misadventure, and they closed the case almost immediately. But their conclusion just didn't seem to make sense for several reasons. Firstly, how had Todd's body gone <laughs> undetected in that lake for three weeks when he was so obviously standing in the middle of it? A group of 1,500 had thoroughly searched that area. It seems strange that nobody spotted him. Secondly, most people who drown are found bobbing face down in the water. But the chilling way in which Todd was standing, it almost appeared as if somebody had placed him there. It also doesn't make sense that Todd would go swimming. Classic cop useless as ever. See, the thing about cops is they go for the easy explanation. They don't really care about actually discovering the, the, the true situation. Like if something's like, obviously something's up here, right? They would rather just be like, oh yeah, there is no foul play. It's just a drunk dude who went swimming and drowned. You know, they don't want to actually go the extra mile to uh, make sure that that's what happened. Okay, that's better. Fully clothed. Not to mention, when he left the orchard, everybody noted how clear Todd's head was like he hadn't had too many drinks at all. In response to these questions, a team of independent investigators examined Todd's remains, and what they discovered was truly disturbing. Although Todd had been missing for three weeks, he had only been dead for two to five days. His body was in too fresh a condition, and there was hardly any insect activity or algae built up on his body. <clears throat> Even stranger, they found absolutely no water in his lungs, none whatsoever, which completely discredited the police's conclusion that he had drowned Thus? and strongly indicated that he had been killed on land and then placed in the water. As oh, so you're saying it wasn't him drowning like he originally said? Result of these findings, 
this independent team conducted a What? A hundred? Huh? What? A hundred. A hundred dollars. Hey, Pig, been watching you for about two years, and it's time I pay my dues. Hope you like the new house. Maybe you're even close to a grocery store now. Nice. True? I am. I actually am. Just wanted to say late for content and keep grinding and being you. You're definitely a guy that works hard. Well, holy shit. Thank you for a hundred fucking dollars. My God. Wow. Okay. Thank you. It's not expecting the that. number of tests with pig carcasses. They placed these carcasses. Why in the would you do that to a pig? To examine the rate at which they decomposed. Pigs are, anatomically, very similar to humans, so they wanted to see if, after three weeks, their carcasses were in a similar condition to Todd's body. As expected, a huge number of insects colonized the pigs. On top of that, there was also a large amount of bloating, foaming, algae and slime buildup, all things that weren't present on Todd. Ew. There was no way he had been in the water for all those weeks, and he had almost certainly been the victim of foul play. This new team theorized that when Todd made it to the paved road, he was actually picked up by one or more people, who then held him on land for a period of time before taking his life and eerily placing him in the water. They even put forward a possible group of suspects, namely the Smiley Face Killers, a group you have likely heard of before. I have? Their existence remains unverified, but many people, including seasoned investigators, believe they're a shadowy group of uh, organized killers who target you. Just a dude, someday. thank you so much for becoming a member. Appreciate that. Successful, popular men, and almost always dump their remains in rivers, canals, and lakes, often leaving behind their graffiti signature. Nope. Chad, oh, no, no, no. You're done. You're done. You're done. You're done. You want to... Oh my god. Focus. Look what he did to my hat. Look. <laughs> he fucking destroyed the back of my hat. Well. Uh. I guess it, I guess it gives a character, doesn't it, Shadow? It just gives it character. All right, I'm putting you back. Just gives it character, chat. Just gives it character. <laughs> what the fuck? I completely forgot it that he was working. He was still chewing on that for so long. Oh my god. Oh well, it still works. Now I don't put away the bird yet because he's just going to keep chewing on my hat. Close to the scene. A crudely sprayed smiley face. I can put on my headphones now. According to some witnesses, one such smiley face was found spray painted on a tree near Ovidal Lake though I can't seem to find any official reports confirming that. The team speculated that the Smileys forced Todd to consume a lethal dose of amitriptyline and desipramine, two prescription substances oh. which were also found in his system and which Todd himself hadn't been prescribed. Despite the independent team's findings, the authorities stuck with their ruling and said Todd had accidentally perished while- not Of course they did! Of course they did, because that's the easy thing to do. The easy thing to do is not actually figure out what happened, but just say that he just accidentally died. That, yeah, that totally checks out. Even though there was no water in his lungs. Totally checks out. It's entirely possible that Todd's demise was a complete accident, but the official version of events ignores too much evidence to be taken seriously, and the quest for definitive answers persists. Accidentally, yep. Todd's mother has tried for years to get her son's case reopened. But even though all the evidence points towards foul play, the cops still refuse to take another look at yeah, it. Yeah, but why would they? Why would they take a look at it? That That's too much work, guys. It's too much work. Cops doing their job? Come on. Remember, Todd lived in a very small community of only 314 people. If somebody did take his life, 
it doesn't seem like it would be hard to find the person <laughs> responsible. That, combined with the authorities refusing to reopen their investigation, has led some people to believe there's a cover-up going on. Which happens all the if time. If that's the case, then the only questions left to answer are who are the authorities protecting, and why? Too much paperwork, yeah. We'll end things with a mystery from Germany. That of Ursula Hermann, the girl in the box. Dude, not gonna lie, Ursula is such a cool fucking name. Like, if so, dude, that's such a cool name to have. Ursula was a sweet and intelligent 10 year old who loved nothing more than gymnastics and playing the piano. In 1981, she lived in the small village of Schondorf, Bavaria, with her parents and brother, Michael. On September 15th, the siblings both attended an after-school piano lesson, after which Ursula took Sounds her bike devious. and rode to a gymnastics class. And Reinhardt? That would be a cool name cousin. to have, too. Being close friends, Ursula went back to her cousin's house in the neighboring village of Ecking, and at 7.30pm, began the short cycle back to her own home. Thing is, she never made it. When God, PM, dude, I hate these stories, man. Fuck. It, it did. It sucks because like, uh, I want, you know, I want my son to be able to like ride his bike everywhere, you know, ride his scooter and whatever, what, what have you ride it wherever he, wherever he wants. But then I always have to worry about dumb fucking shit like this where kids just get yoinked all the time. I mean, this is Germany, but I mean, in America, this happens all the time too, where kids just get yoinked. Rolled around. Ursula's mother called her cousins. Why can't people just like daughter would be leaving soon. not do this? That'd be cool. The cousin's mother told her that Ursula had left 30 minutes earlier. The ride should have only taken five to ten minutes, so immediately alarm bells started ringing. The two households immediately started searching the areas between Schondorf and Ecking, but there was no sign of Ursula anywhere. Her parents went straight to the police station, and before long. A huge scale search effort was underway. Almost the entire population <clears throat> of both villages were out looking for Ursula, but their efforts were all in vain. Two days later, on September 17th, Ursula's parents received a bizarre phone call from an unknown person. When the phone rang, they both jumped for the receiver, hoping against hope that someone was calling with information about their daughter's whereabouts. You can't imagine the first this few man. Seconds of the call, though, all they heard on the other end of the line. Times aren't what they used to. I disagree. Uh, times are the same as they were. However, we're just more aware that this shit happens. Because back then, yeah, people rode their bikes all the time, blah, 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 blah. But it wasn't, we don't have the internet. So you don't know the moment someone gets kidnapped. You know, you don't. you don't know all this information. Back then, you just didn't know. You know, there could be people all over the place getting kidnapped but you don't even know like if you lived in in a small town where nothing ever happens when when you know back then when we didn't have the internet you just assume that that's just how the world works right but now that we have the internet everything is available to us all the time so right when a kid gets kidnapped or some terrible thing happens we all are aware of it it's the same with like like you know a, 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 like racism and uh lgbtq shit and like like uh, homophobia and stuff like that where we in our small towns we don't even think that it's that big of a deal until the internet started happening and then people were like oh this is a genuine problem you know i feel like the internet is good in that way where a lot of people didn't back then just didn't realize that all this shit was going on <clears throat> was silence then an eerie radio jingle began to play. They didn't know what to make of it. After receiving three identical calls, the authorities began tapping the family phone lines. Why didn't they tap the phone lines right off the bat? Days after that first call, a mysterious letter arrived in the mail, made from letters cut out from books. It read as follows. Is this literally a fucking ransom letter? Like, what what is happening?
flyers was the internet yeah like basically your newspaper was the internet back then we have taken your daughter if you ever want to see her alive again pay two million deutschmarks as a ransom two million deutschmarks worked out to be roughly 1.2 million dollars a huge sum which the herman family simply didn't have still they were going to agree to pay and worry about how later but how were they supposed to tell the burbs that they were willing to pay? Well, as it turns out, the note had arrived much later than the burbs had anticipated. It was supposed to have been read before the first phone call was made, but due to postal delays, had arrived after. The oh, you're kidding me. The that they played over the phone was supposed to elicit a yes or no response with regards to the ransom payment, but without the note telling them that, there was no way Ursula's parents could have known. Well, the next time the phone rang, Ursula's mother confirmed that they would indeed pay. Then, on Monday the 21st, a final letter arrived. This one detailing the payment instructions. Fucking postal office man. The money must be made in Murdering people Deutsche every day. Bills. Ursula's father should deliver the packed suitcase. The date and location will be communicated later. Thank you, you Autumn. The yellow Fiat 600, no faster than 90 kilometers an hour. Over the course of the next few days, the Hermans reached out to everyone in their community for support, and as a result, were able to raise the two million Deutschmarks they needed to get their- Damn! And that's some support! What the hell? Nice. They were actually able to raise that much money? That's insanity. They must have had like a rich friend. Let me fix my camera. No. Is that better? Okay. My hat is just bugging out. Okay. Their daughter back. Now all they had to do was wait for the perps to tell them when and where to meet. But those instructions never came. After two weeks with no contact, search efforts for Ursula reignited. Hundreds of officers, tens of sniffer dogs, and many people from the villages combed the woods. This time, they used metal rods to search beneath the leaves and foliage. Finally, 19 long days after Ursula had first disappeared, a huge discovery was made. Using a metal rod, one of the officers found something hidden beneath the forest floor. What the fuck? A green box, shallowly buried in the earth. Inside was the... What the fuck? lifeless body of Ursula Herman. Everyone was devastated. Ursula's parents had agreed to pay the ransom, so why had the perp so callously taken her life? It's because the fuck- it, dude, it's- it, is it literally because the post office? I'm gonna go insane. If it's because the post office, oh my god. Well, as it would turn out, they likely hadn't meant to. To begin with, Ursula's remains were examined. It was clear that she hadn't put up much of a fight, had likely been sedated when she was first taken, and hadn't tried to escape. As for the box she was entombed in, it had actually been designed to keep Ursula both alive and entertained. There was food and water inside it, along with books, a small bulb, a radio, a toilet bucket, and a ventilation pipe, which went up to the surface so she could- nice They went- $50, man? What the fuck? Okay, now I feel better about watching your content for free and your songs. Hopefully you get that Spotify situation cleared up. I'll put your songs on repeat to try to do my part. Get your listen count back. I'm gonna... That reminds me. I'll talk about the Spotify shit after this video. Thank you so much, Ghost. Holy shit. That is way too much money. I do not deserve that. Thank you. Breathe. But uh, what I was saying, why? Like, why they went through that much effort? It, it, it's so sad that they didn't even mean to kill the child. They didn't even want to kill the child. I don't, it didn't seem like they wanted to. It was all because the fucking post office got delayed. Are you kidding? It's like how they hadn't anticipated their ransom note being delivered late 
they had also failed to consider air circulation. Despite designing the box to keep Ursula alive, she'd ultimately- Dude, that, that's actually insane that they did this, but they didn't want to kill the child, accidentally killed the child, didn't get the money. Perished due to a lack of oxygen. The ventilation pipe simply didn't allow for enough air exchange. And in all likelihood, she had suffocated just a few hours after being placed in the box. The authorities quickly realized that the box was far too big and heavy for one person to have moved alone, meaning there were at least two perps involved. They were quickly tipped off that a man named Werner Mazarek <clears throat> may have been one of those responsible. Mazarek lived next door to Ursula and her family, and was known to be in a lot of debt, so he certainly had a motive. Thing is, he also had an alibi. He claimed that at the time Ursula disappeared, he was playing the board game Risk with his wife and her friends, something which they all confirmed. He was taken in for questioning anyway, but released after several days. After his release, an acquaintance of his, Klaus Pfaffinger, told the authorities that Masaryk had asked him to dig a hole out in the woods not long before Ursula vanished. Thing is, when the authorities asked Pfaffinger to take them to the hole, he was unable to do so, and recanted his statement. Perhaps he was lying for attention. Perhaps he wanted revenge on Masarek for something. Or perhaps he was involved in some way. Yeah, that just sounds like he didn't want to show him because then he'll realize that he'll get put in prison as well. In 2007, the statute of limitations on the case was fast approaching. By that point, Pfaffinger had passed away, and the only living suspect was Werner Masarek. With nothing left to go on, and the case about to freeze over forever, the authorities raided Masarek's house and found a Grundig model TK-248 tape recorder, something which he could have used to play the jingle all those years ago. They used that tape recorder, along with Pfaffinger's past statement, to take Masarek and his wife to trial. In all honesty, it wasn't a lot to go on, with all of this evidence being circumstantial. There was no DNA evidence or fingerprints to speak of. I, ha I hate that own. everyone in this... In Everybody in these fucking stories, everybody gets away. Brother, Michael, didn't believe that the couple were responsible. Still, against all odds, Werner Masarek was found guilty and sentenced to lifelong imprisonment. His wife was acquitted. To this day, Masarek remains behind bars, though there are many who consider him to be an innocent man, most notably Michael Herman. In 2016, Michael was able to get Masarek a retrial, this time with strong evidence that he wasn't the one responsible for what happened to Ursula. Sound expert. Classic fu- Did, To be fair, if this guy didn't do it, that's classic cops right there, man. They lock someone up because they're close enough to what the actual, you know, like, like, you know, they found like a little bit of something that could potentially be a part of it. And they're like, you know, fuck it, lock him up for life. Which to be fair, he like, he might have done it. But still, like that is classic uh, cop work right there where they kind of just, they, they just want it to get done. You know what I mean? Experts had analyzed the tape recorder and said there was no way to prove it was the one that had played the jingles. A language expert examined Unless the ransom note it had it on there. that it had to have been made by someone who spoke broken German. Someone who wasn't a native speaker like Masarek. Still, the court refused to overturn his conviction. The final update in this case happened just the last year, nearly 30 years after Ursula's life was taken. In March 2021, top German media houses received an anonymous letter in the mail. This still unidentified person confessed that he and his friends were the ones responsible for taking Ursula's life back when they were high school students in 1981, and that Masaryk was an innocent man. It remains unknown whether this confession was legit or not, but with this case now officially closed, it's unlikely anyone's going to look into it. Dude, that's what I, I hate. I hate when they do that, man, when they just like give up and just like say, oh, yeah, he's close enough. Let's lock him up for life. Like, what if, what if he didn't do it? He's literally locked up for life for nothing. I don't know.
That happens too much, man. That happens way too much. Regardless. Good video. Good video, Lazy Masquerade. Now it's time to walk away. I hope you enjoyed your stay. Did you laugh or cry or maybe subscribe? I'll thank you either way. You know I will miss you. I hope you return. Tell your friend or your mother to get me more views, please.